Hi, I'm Mark Crescento, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So I apologize, you're gonna have to bear with me again. I'm still uh, sick and trying to uh, to power through, but we have a lot of fun things to talk about. So uh, just to give you an idea of, of how we're gonna break it down, we wanna look at have the global risks changed and if they have, how so, for better or worse, because there's a mixed bag in terms of some things that have gotten uh, better, you know, uh, supply chains, things that remain problematic, both rates, inflation, and I think we wanna look at some of those key pieces. And then that gets us into the next level of <clears throat> The second se segment of does the Fed cut rates this year? And, and, and you know, the short answer is I, we don't think so. And we're going to go through why we think it's going to be difficult for them to, to cut rates, even though there's, there's some precedent where they should. But we want to look at what that precedent is and how, you know, one piece fits, but the other piece doesn't. And what are those interactions? Then, the, then we're going to go to how is the consumer change in 2023? Like, are we seeing a bigger change? Are we going to see a bigger slowdown? And I think that's going to be really important as we go to summer and some of those key spending periods for the underlying consumer. And then we want to uh, then go to European services. So we have more PMI data, more data from there. European services continue to outperform while manufacturing slows again. And that's, I think, a, a big piece that we want to look at between the two. And then we want to round out with China and, and the rest of, uh, of Asia. But China, and, and specifically speaking, how much stimulus can they really achieve? And, and I think that's the biggest misnomer in the market right now is the view that they have this, ex, um, this extensive ability to stimulate significantly or, or in a, really even in a meaningful way. And we want to walk through why that isn't the case and why it's going to, uh, if you're relying on China to kind of save us again, as they have in multiple periods, why that's not going to happen this time versus the last couple. And the last couple, if you want to break it down as to when, you know, they really were, were a pivotal in getting us out of the European financial crisis, uh, the slowdowns that were starting in 16 and then again in 18. And then things started to dry up as we went into 2020. And then obviously we had COVID. So <clears throat> we want to break that down into its different pieces. So looking at the global picture, we really want to jump uh, th use this as a jumping off point of global core CPI. And this is the important piece is the core side, because there's obviously the headline numbers. You're going to have your year over year numbers and the year over year numbers. You'll be surprised to know based on math, they're going to go down because things are not as bad as they were. But it doesn't mean that they're getting better. And that's why we want to look at the month on month because we continue to see these increases on a month over month basis. It's like, yes, when you look at the speed of the increases on a year over year basis, they've obviously slowed, but we're still seeing more and more get added and the pain to the consumer continues to grow higher. So global X China and Turkey, because Turkey is its own uh, fun craziness. You can see that uh, based on fourth quarter 2022 average and the January, February average is actually accelerating. You know, when you look at the US, it's accelerating. When you look at the Euro, Euro area, accelerating. Japan, same. China, same. And that's where when you look at some of the backdrops, and China is actually slowing a little bit more, but we'll talk about that in, in segment five. You can see that there's that pressure continues to mount on the consumer. And then we have some charts, uh, especially on copper and some of the shortages that we're seeing where you're not going to get a huge adjustment to these issues getting re re reversed lower. And one of the key pieces that we want to look at as well is when we start looking at food, because that's, a, a, again, going to be a key driver, especially that global X China and Turkey, because you're seeing that pressure point. So while the data here can give the, you know, the central banks an ability to maybe pause for a quarter or for a month to kind of let some of this come up. It also kind of shows you that it's going to be difficult to see a lot of rate cuts. And that's the biggest problem and why we liken this so much back to the 70s, because there's those natural, there were natural and, and politically created shortages on the commodity side that is kind of buffering and keeping those prices elevated. You also have asset prices that have gone up. So 
it's going to be difficult to see any type of meaningful rate cut, which is why we expect that bigger stagnation and the bigger slowdown in global growth, because inflation is still a problem. And this is going to impact the way consumers interact with, within, their, within specific countries and why we think that the consumer on a global level still has way more downside. And, and, and typically, the consumer does not go first. Typically, the consumer starts to drop after we start to see some of those breakdowns. And there's a great chart that we're going to talk about in, uh, in segments two and three that look at the U.S. consumer, and that even after 08 really started to unfold the way it did, the consumer actually went up, got stronger before you started to see this fall off. And that's why we want to look at this and how this is going to weigh longer term. And then when you think about the long term price increase on just operations, it's important to look at population shifts because the share of world's population living in rich and poor countries, low income countries have seen a population increase while high income countries continue to see some of that slowdown. And it, and it comes down to uh, some of the different pieces of the labor force adjustments. And we've seen the labor force come, uh, it, you know, come under continuous pressure. And we're seeing it again, like especially in the US where you don't have the participation rates that you should have, which is inc- which means that wages have to go up to incentivize people to stay in the uh, in the jobbing world or to come back into the job market. And you're seeing how that has accelerated in Europe, in Japan, Japan specifically, and then it's going to be, you know, for China for the most part, fall off a bit of a cliff, and how that that's going to increase underlying cost because they're especially China, it was was a cheap place to do business. Now you have to go to other areas and those other areas will then get more expensive. And that's where you get this kind of cycle on how the cost of manufacturing is going to go up. And we're going to need some sort of massive breakthrough on the manufacturing side in terms of AI and all these other types of uh, machine learning and all the other kitschy terms to try to bring some of this cost back down. But there's that pivot time and then there was, I, I forget who came out with it, but they did a study on when did computers actually make life easier. And even though computers were really, you know, went more mainstream into you know, business wise, 70s into really the 80s, that we didn't really optimize the usage of it and actually have it reduce work time till the late 90s. And, and that's where it's like you hear these comments about machine learning and all this. But it's like, but how can we apply it to a level that actually makes our day better or easier or faster? And that's going to be some of those key pieces and, and learning bits that we're going to have to look at. And then just rounding this off, the share of U.S. population 65 and older versus 17 and younger. And this is what we've been talking about, where we are already at that crossing point, And that's going to, again, weigh on who's paying into Social Security, who's paying into Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid, and how that continues to grow. But now one of the things that the U.S. is benefiting from is the growth of migrants, because the U.S. is still a preferred destination for people looking for more opportunity. So that's why we benefit longer term versus the Europe versus China when you look at the stabilization that we're going to get because on a, on a one-for-one basis, the U.S. population is, just, is shrinking, but as more immigration comes in, it helps to offset. So when you take all of this into, per, into perspective in terms of kind of the long-term price increases over time, you also have the near term, the risk perception worsened this month across all categories, which I don't think is surprising given this is when you had the bank failures, you, this is when you started to see credit pressures, and there's a lot of risk out there. Now, how that risk gets calculated, here you can see that forecasts have continued to uh, to move a bit lower. They've actually moved higher so far this year, but when you look at, at Goldman, Goldman is essentially telling you that we're not going to have a recession, and that's where you know, it's a, it's a bold call. I don't. I think that there is a lot that is lining up to show that that isn't the case, but it's just going to be a matter of timing. Like when does all when do all of the stars align and we get that bigger slowdown? And and there's just right now politicians, central banks are just plugging holes, so the dam is breaking. 
and they're they're up to I, I, let's just say the last foot and toes trying to plug the holes, and then at some point it just comes cascading down because there's just no way to stop and just I have to let it move through the system and clear itself out instead of trying to uh, to, to stop or hold back what is already happening. And that's why where you start looking at the recession odds. So the latest Bloomberg, Bloomberg survey of economists conducted after SVB and other closures shows probability of a recession in the next 12 months has risen to 65%, up from 60%. And the, this this is now where the joke comes in, where uh, where economists have called ten of the last two recessions. So just because they say there's going to be a recession, or at least over half, doesn't mean that it actually happens. But it's just when you layer in all the problems, it's going to be hard to avoid it. And those are some. And then we, you know, we have some data sets in the U.S. Spe- uh, specifically in the next segment showing that things are happening today that only happen in recessions. And that's where, you know, Goldman could be saying, well, you know, we're set over the next 12 months and it's really going to be in 2024, not this year. Uh, Again, a lot of semantics, but I don't think the central bank has the capacity nor the ability given the pressure points that we currently have to avoid what is the, uh, the coming onslaught. Now, on the other side, when you start looking at Container rates, container rates have come down. Global shipping rates continue to edge lower. That is a positive for the consumer because it brings some of those prices down as the supply chain really kind of prices itself back into normal. But the price boom looks to be almost completely over. But when you look at the combined container traffic at major U.S. ports from 2015 to 2023 for the month of February, you get an idea that we the only we're below the levels that we've been at going back to 2016. We're over 2015 levels, but against normal periods, this is low. And when you when and in the next segment we're going to go into when we look at flows, you're going to see that uh, sales slowed and inventories rose while new shipments, new traffic coming in continues to be at a, at a multi-year low, almost a, a decade low. So then when you look at global stockpiles of specific uh, commodities, and we wanted to just touch on copper because copper is an important piece of the green movement, the green shift. So right now, when you go back through time, global copper stockpiles at this current rate will deplete by August. And the question is, at what point point does that fix itself so for anybody who's been in commodities you know the the cure for high prices are is high prices and when you and the reason why is because high prices slow down demand and incentivize people to bring new mines online the problem now is there's a lot of political headwinds to bring on said mines and that is slowing some of that natural movements which is why we've talked about This is a lot like the 70s, where there were a lot of politically motivated limitations that stopped some of these commodities coming online. And then we had a fairly slow economy for an extended period of time. And those are things that are playing back up, especially when we look at copper. You know, and when you start looking at the U.S. and using the U.S. as a proxy before, you know, to go abroad, when you look at food, you know, what do Americans believe about their food and their food system? So 60%, uh, 69% said climate change will impact food prices. I think that people are coming, uh, again, whether it's climate change, you know, weather pattern shifts, I am not sitting here telling you that climate change is or isn't created by humans. All I am saying is that weather patterns are getting more extreme. Whether it is cyclical and it happens naturally, whether humans are accelerating it, that is not the debate I'm having here. The debate I'm having is weather patterns are shifting. That's, that's, you can see it with drought data. You can see it with flood data. I'm not saying that humans did or did not accelerate it. I'm just saying that it's here. And that is going to make things difficult on a yield basis, on a growth basis. And that's going to impact in the long-term food prices. And if in the U.S. we're concerned about it, the largest buyer in the world, the country, a country that can feed itself, well, what does that mean for the country that can't or has to rely on the international market? Local food is better for the environment. 63% say that is true. Okay, well, that means that if, you're, if you agree with that, 
Well, then you can't buy. Why are you feeding your kids watermelon in April, uh, in, in November? That that watermelon has to get on a boat from Latin America, come up the coast. So sure, it, it is because you're not going to burn diesel, gas oil. But are you willing to to not have that accessibility? You know, agriculture is a large compl- a contributor to climate change. You know, that is something that is changing, but you know, that's also going to increase cost because it's going to be more costly at times outside of our investment in Saltec, you know, a little plug for, for, uh, for Saltec, you know, it, you will see that cost go up and organic food is more nutritious. That is true to a point. There are things to be done, but again, you're, you're starting to see some of these problems that are growing and becoming more f- uh, a focal point. Then when you start looking at food behaviors, well, Americans consider changing in 2023, eat more fruits and vegetables, exercise more, eat less sugar, eat or, uh, eating fewer calories. So how are people going to change? And then how is that going to impact the greater world in terms of what is available? Because if the U.S. is looking to eat more fruits and vegetables, I don't know if you've seen what's happening in Morocco, in the U.K., in the E.U., there's shortages. You know, the U.S. is always going to get first dibs on fruits and vegetables because we pay the highest price. We're willing to pay the highest price. But if we're getting it shipped to us and there's a shortage abroad, it means someone else isn't getting it. And how is that going to balance when you look at the, you know, the, the, the food conundrum of emerging markets, developing markets, and their inability to access nutrition uh, on a broader basis? Now, when you take this and and now shift to another economic conundrum, when you look at Wells Fargo's data suggests that a significant increase in the value of construction put in place for manufacturing facilities may indicate a shift towards reshoring activities, particularly in the computer and electronics industry. So when you start looking at that nearshoring, onshoring, you're seeing it accelerate, but again, that increases cost because you now have to go build a new facility in a in an area that likely has a higher labor cost. Now, the U.S. labor cost is, is offset to a degree because we're more efficient than many, which means that, yes, you'll pay more, but you'll get more for your money. But that is going to be a near-term and then a longer-term cost increase, which is why when you look at pricing, that's, again, that re-rating higher, which we're continuing to see. And then as the private computer, electronic, electro, uh, electrical manufacturing, construction spending has surged. And again, their companies are going to re- recoup that cost. So $56.3 billion has been spent or plans to be spent. Well, that means that stuff is going to have to get more expensive so that they can recoup their cost and make a margin on it, but again, also protect their underlying supply chain and, and make things more redundant. And that's why when you start looking at wind projects by estimate year, and again, coming back to copper, we have copper shortages, we have new onshoring. So if we're onshoring, nearshoring, you're going to need, especially on the electronic side, you're going to need power for the grid to manage that because a lot of these new things coming over, especially on the electronic side, are juice heavy. They suck a lot of electricity, but it's tough to do it with an intermittent capacity. So you have under construction, which is that that 5,000 uh, megawatts when you look at the breakdown, but early development, you know, what is early development? And that's just, our, and that's where how much of this actually crosses the finish line because there's a lot of people in the market making these estimates on grid reliability that are assuming early development means that they're definitely going to come to market. And as zero interest rate policies go away, rates go up, some of the economics stop making sense. And as that happens, you're going to have banks that are going to pull their backing. They're going to pull their funding, which is going to make it difficult. So that early development is really going to, I think advanced development is far enough along that that early development and the announced is going to shrink more than I think what is expected in the market. And it's also the cost of building them is going to go up because a lot of copper goes into onshore and offshore wind. Now, just to, I thought this was an interesting article, and, and I think it comes and hits at why we created this show. And the reason why we created this show is because I'm, we're going to show you data that is good and bad. I, I, I may come across as bearish or more bullish at times, depending on what we're talking about. Like, based on this, I'm bullish copper pricing, but 
uh, I am bearish on where uh, global growth is going to be. And the, the, each of those might sound counterintuitive because typically, you know, copper prices go down when things go down, but we already went through why. You know, we're not, I'm not here to tell you how I feel about something. I will give you an opinion on how I think the data melds together, but this just gives you an idea of why people are so annoyed with mainstream media because the, you're, they're using things like uh, tr to generate an, anger, an angry reply, a disgusted reply, a fear, where that joy in neutral is going down because they're trying to capture that sadness, that fear factor, that anger factor on all sides of the aisle. And I'm here saying, I'm going to give you a balanced approach. Clearly, with the fact that we've only achieved 4,000 subscribers to date, and these guys have millions and millions of, <laughs> of people signing on, they're doing something right. But again, it comes down to why does clickbait exist? This is why clickbait exists, because the numbers are in their favor, get, giving way, which is why we drew, created this program, why we thought this program was going to be relevant, and why we would like you to continue to support us by trying to like, share, subscribe, because this is, I think, a big component of where we go from here. Now, in the next segment, we're going to go deeper into the U.S. and some of the pieces for the U.S. and, uh, and where we think they're going to go in general.